Hey, welcome to this episode of the In Session Podcast brought to you by Air Gigs. I'm David Blacker, and today I had the real pleasure to sit down with prolific engineer, producer, composer, and musician George Schilling. George's work spans a real diverse range of styles and genres, and he's worked with some of the biggest names in the business, including Steve Winwood, James Brown, Oasis, The Coors, Primal Scream, Boy George, Teenage Fan Club, Mike Oldfield, The Soup Dragons, and many, many others. So I really enjoyed our conversation for multiple reasons. I mean, first off, George is just a warm, friendly, engaging guy and fun to talk to. But beyond that, um, he really has a unique perspective because um, he's worn so many hats in a professional context, you know, from being a professional mixing engineer and producer to a session musician and a teacher and an educator today. So it was fun on all those levels, being able to shift back and forth between those different perspectives and also follow along with his journey from starting out as an intern, just getting coffee and tea for clients all the way up to producing major label sessions. So I think you're really going to enjoy this episode. And without further ado, let's jump right into it. Hey, George, thanks so much for taking the time, man. I really appreciate uh, getting this opportunity to sit down with you and chat. You're very welcome. I'm, I appreciate you taking the trouble to call me and uh, talk to me. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So I, there's a bunch of stuff I'm excited to, to um, explore with you, but I just, you know, how's your day going so far? Why don't we start with the present? Well, it, today I've actually had a slightly unusual day because uh, I haven't actually been in the studio, but I've been in my front room with my laptop and my sort of mobile Pro Tools rig, getting ready to go to a university in the north of England to go and do a little bit of a demonstration and a lecture about how I mix things. So um, I'm going to go and talk to some talk to some students. So I've just been preparing all the all the stuff for that with my little rig and making sure all the sessions load properly on my laptop and that all the all the plugins are up to date. <laughs> Gotcha. Yeah, that's important. Do you do a lot of uh, educational stuff? or I, I, Increasingly, a um, little bits and bobs. You know, it's just the odd day here and there. But it, it's nice because, you know, when I grew up, I, I learned I didn't I never studied music technology. I, I was a musician and then I got a job in a studio and watched other people doing it. Um, and, I, you know, I was very lucky. I was in that place where I could just watch all these great guys doing stuff. And that doesn't really happen so much now. You know, it, people ask me, can they come and assist on sessions or watch what I'm doing? And, and I usually say no. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I kind of so I'm making up for that by going and doing some of these educational things. And I'm now part of a team of accreditors. So I go and visit universities and, you know, look, turn up with my clipboard and talk to students and the course leaders and people like that. Make sure they're teaching the kids stuff that's really useful when you're actually in the real world. What What are a few of those things? Like, what are, what are the things that you find sort of uh, that well, you, you shine a light on? Um, how to coil up a microphone cable. Okay, yeah. <laughs> real world. You how know. to make a good cup of tea. Sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, but you know, most of the, these kids, so they're they're um, they're cleverer than me, and they know more about all the all the shortcuts in Pro Tools and all the theories and signal flow and all that kind of stuff. And I've just learnt by doing it really over the years. So um, you know, it's just a different way of coming coming at things, I suppose. Absolutely. Well, cool, man. Well, we've jumped forward in time a little bit, and now I'm going to jump back because I'm sure I'm really curious about how you know you first started out. I know. You know, from doing a little research, you you played cello as a young mm. young lad, and then piano as well, and then that evolved into mixing. So maybe take us a little through that early journey. Sure. Okay. Well, I was I grew up in a musical family. My my parents and my dad in particular was an opera singer. Um, so when I was growing up, I had all the embarrassment of my friends coming home from school. <laughs> And my dad would be in the front room practicing his scales and and all these kind of vocal exercises, which was highly embarrassing when you're, you know, 12 years old and bringing friends home. So I didn't have many friends. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and I used to get dragged to the and he was he was good at it. You know, he's, you can still hear some of his recordings on Spotify and Apple Music, um, but he, he'd be 98 years old if he was still alive today. So he was a bit of an older dad. An wow. older father. What's, what was his name? If in case his name was Eric, Eric Schilling. Eric um, Schilling. Cool. So he was a singer at the English National Opera at the London Coliseum. Sorry, that was about my phone dinging. 
Oh, no uh, worries. That's quite annoying, isn't it? I don't know how to stop it doing that. Anyway, uh, he was, yes, he was uh, one of the principal baritones at the, the English National Opera at the London Coliseum, and he appeared on television a few times and the radio and made a few recordings. Um, and so he was, you know, he was reasonably successful at that. Uh, I had no interest whatsoever in singing, and um, but when the cello teacher turned up at school when I was about seven years old, and said, does it, you know, does anyone want to start learning the cello? And of course, the whole class put their hand up. <laughs> and, um, right. and to cut a long story short, by the end of the, you know, end of the first year, I think there were about ten kids started playing it. By the end of the first year, it was just me, pretty much. And um, and I persisted, and I carried on, and I was, I don't know, so I think some of the musicality that was going on in the in the home sort of rubbed off on me. So I had a bit of a natural talent for it. Um, and that seemed the, you know, the natural career path. So when I left school, I went to the Royal College of Music and that was very hard to get into. I got offered a place at the Royal College and the Royal Academy, all these top conservatoire places in London. But it wasn't really for me because by this stage, I was much more interested in rock and roll. I'd been playing electric guitar in a band that I'd taught myself. And also, because my father was um, learning all his parts, he was an early adopter and had a reel-to-reel tape recorder in the house ever since I could remember, uh, which was quite an unusual thing in the 1970s, you know, for people to have at home. Well, now you can record anything on an iPhone, but uh, in those days, to be able to record things was quite a novelty. And I was fascinated by this thing, and it had it was a little four-track, uh, quarter-inch uh, Tandberg machine, so it was a European machine, and he'd had a Grundig before that, I think. So um, that was the kind of the centrepiece of our, our hi-fi system at home, of our, of our music system. So so I used to play with that and plug my electric guitar into it and to you know change the speed. It had, ran at three different speeds, and obviously you could play things backwards by turning the tape upside down and all that kind of stuff. And I, I got absolutely fascinated by this thing and started borrowing books from the local library on how to do tape recording. And so that was where my heart was kind of moving towards. And so after a very short time at the Royal College of Music, I applied for a job, first of all, at the BBC, where they were advertising for sound operators for television. And because I and the, the Royal College of Music was a very stuffy and old fashioned establishment. Uh, but I, I discovered the BBC was even more stuffy and old fashioned. So, so that right. wasn't for me either. Um, so I wrote to lots of independent studios um, and and eventually, well, fairly quickly, actually got offered a job. Um, so I started at Livingston Studios in North London and made the tea there and and just learned by watching. They had fantastic engineers in house. The The boss was. Jerry Boys, who engineered lots of great records in the 1970s uh, folk albums. And, and then he did the Buena Vista Social Club with Ry Cuda. Sure. Um, so he was a very, you know, very competent engineer. Um, and um, I learned by watching people like that. And, and I was very lucky because at the studio where I worked, um, they started having a few successful projects coming in, even though it, was, it wasn't by any stretch of the imagination a top a top of the range studio. It wasn't Abbey Road. Livingston was very much just a mid range studio. But because Jerry knew what he was doing, it had good equipment and they upgraded while I was there and expanded. And we started getting some good projects. And um, so I was very lucky and in the right place at the right time and um, engineered some, some great projects while I was still there. So, um, That's very so that cool. was how I got into it. And, and did it did it evolve sort of organically while you were in the studio, going from very sort of like you're saying, you know, making tea and, and just being available, mm. doing every, you know any job under the sun, to suddenly, you know, was there a moment that you started to realize you were getting moved up the ranks, so to speak? Or well, it was yes, because I, I, you know, I was, I was being you know typical sort of arrogant twenty year old and thought I knew better than all these engineers who were coming in as freelancers. And I was getting a bit frustrated. And then all of a sudden, you know, just about when I was probably at the point of giving it all up to do something different, um, this pair of DJs came uh, called Cold Cut and they, they booked into the studio and they'd worked with some of the older engineers like Jerry and didn't really get on very well with them because Jerry and people of that era didn't really understand how DJs made records. It was a whole new thing in the late 1980s. And I was young and keen and I had friends from school still I was in touch with who, even though I wasn't particularly a dance music fan, but they, they ran a, a, you know, sort of illegal pirate house music station playing from playing out of a, a council um, estate in East London, uh, broadcasting house music to people. And so for me to be working with these kind of really cool house DJs, I thought that would give me some kudos. So, so I started engineering their sessions 
and they very quickly had some success and you know within a few months i'd engineered well i was i think i was still 21 years old i'd engineered the biggest selling record so far that year which was a single called the only way is up by yaz and the plastic population sure <laughs> and it was number one in the charts for five weeks in in england which was you know huge so um i got my I still got my gold disc hanging on the wall for that one <clears throat> that must have been really exciting at 20 right that was one yeah incredible so I was so I was so lucky with that, um, and and at the same time the studio was expanding, um, and then on the same record label uh, there was a much kind of more up my street kind of artist called the Soup Dragons, which was a kind of indie guitar, you know, indie dance, which everything was in about 1990. So um, I managed to end up working with them. They they'd done a record they weren't happy with, um, and so I got involved sort of halfway through it and. And we kind of turned it into a very trendy indie dance album with lots of drum loops on it, even though they were kind of guitar band. Um, and they, the label very generously offered me a small producer royalty on it. Um, and that did really well. I think it sold something like half a million copies in the States straight off the bat, you know. So um, Is that the so one they, with that hit, I'm Free, on it? Is that, that's is the it? one, yeah. yeah. We, so I recorded that song from scratch. We'd already finished the album. Um, and it was it actually got released before we'd recorded that, that song. And then they had this idea of doing I'm Free, which was actually, I don't know if you know, it's a Rolling Stones song. It was a really obscure Rolling Stones B-side. Oh, yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, now, now if that you, I if you, think about it. Yeah, I... if, if you hear the original, it's terrible. Right. <laughs> but uh, the Sean, the guy in the band, had this vision for it, and we... I think we pinched a drum loop from a Jungle Brothers record, and uh, and Sean, the singer, said, um, you know, I want it to have a really gospel-y feel. And I said, well, let's get a gospel choir in, uh, not really knowing what the implications of that were, because it <laughs> cost an absolute fortune for them right. to do that. And the record label were all there in the studio because it was all kind of done under union rules. So if we'd gone a minute over the allotted three hours or whatever it was we'd have had to pay double the amount or something <laughs> so it was lots of lots of stress going on but you know and, and the original recording of that song was nine and a half minutes long or something i think on the multi-track um but uh yeah so we you know we we got the gus gospel choir on and there's a bit of sort of reggae toasting in the middle of it and i remember it was jazz summers was the boss of the record label and the first mix i did he rang me up and he said he said george that um that wacka wacka guitar sound, that's a hit sound. We need <laughs> more of that. And he, he meant the wah wah, yeah. which um, a bit of trivia for you. In fact, it's not a wah wah pedal on that. That's um, that's me bouncing the, because we're all on analog tape, of course, in those days. So I'm bouncing the guitar part from one track to another and adding the wah wah with an EQ. So I was using a, a GML EQ sitting on top of the mixing desk with a, a very narrow bandwidth and doing the wah wah myself. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm curious, like when you, uh, so you, you know, growing up in a musical family, like sometimes that has the reverse effect, you know, where, yeah. and, and so that didn't with you, it wasn't a well, turn I mean, off. I, my, or... my rebellion was that I did, I, you know, I kind of went off classical music, I suppose. Right. And, the, and I kind of, you know, my parents were, my dad was a lot older than me, obviously. And um, so, you know, I, I therefore... I suppose it, I was turned off classical music a right. bit by then, and, and I was certainly never a particularly an opera fan. Uh, I'm very proud now of, of the achievements my father made, you know, and, and the stuff he did. But um, but even now, I probably I'm unlikely to sort of very often sit down and listen to a, uh, an audio recording of a whole opera of <laughs> an evening. You know? Sure. When you were considering, so you're in, in the Royal College of Music and you had a moment, obviously, where you said, okay, this is not really happening for mm. me. And you had a choice where you said, like, was there anyone who you were modeling or you just sort of, you know, like, was no, there? I don't, yeah. No, I don't think I was. I was, no, uh, I suppose, you know, it was just my own little decision. Well, I think... You know, my my parents weren't. They didn't throw their hands up in horror when I said I wanted to leave the Royal College of Music. I think they were probably glad that I'd be going out and earning some money. You know, because <laughs> I was still living sure. at home. So, <laughs> and they were wonderful parents. You know, they were very supportive. My mum is still alive and still knocking around because she was much younger than my dad. Uh, and they've, you know, they've been all been always been very supportive of whatever it was I wanted to do, which was which was really, I was very lucky in that respect. <clears throat> that's cool so but uh, becoming like an engineer that was a new or but you you were saying you were you were messing with the the reel to reel so you kind of yeah, had a I'd, feel for it and it was I calling you a yeah, little I'd, bit 
A little bit, yeah, because I, I mean, I'd never been inside a recording studio or had a clue what all the knobs did on the desk, you know, or anything like that. But uh, so I, I, it was very elementary, my, my dabbling with a tape recorder. Um, you know, it was copying things from one track to another. And it was it was very amateurish, obviously, until I got into a studio. Um, but uh, I think I was a fairly fast learner once I got there. Uh, well, certainly in terms of the technical aspects, I think it took me longer to learn the people skills, perhaps, um, which is, you know, which is a fairly important part of it when you're actually in the room collaborating with people. Um, it, it helps if you're if you're a nice guy. <laughs> Absolutely. I've heard that. I, I've heard that from a lot of people we've interviewed, you know, from different session musicians have worked with all kinds of people have said, you know, it's not all about the playing. It's not all about the ears. It's it's about how you you know it's the whole thing, like how you conduct yourself, how you you know are you an easy guy to hang out with, you know the whole nine. Yeah, so. and and funnily enough, you know, which touches upon the whole air gigs thing. I think that's still important, even though you're dealing with people over the internet. You've still got to be a, a nice guy about it and re- willing to put the hours in. You know, you've got to kind of do the go the extra mile sometimes and uh, and just be. You know, because somebody's paying you to do something and all they want is a great result. So some, it's like whatever it takes to get there. Because a lot of people of my vintage, you know, we'll have, we've got our own little secret private groups on Facebook where we moan about clients and getting sure. tracks that aren't labeled properly or all this kind of stuff. But, you know, that's part of the job. You've got to, you've got to do that. You've got to do the job and, and deliver it properly. The last, the last air gigs job, well, I probably shouldn't, tell, <laughs> shouldn't reveal this. Please go ahead. But, uh, well, the last egg job was a, was a cello playing one, um, and you know I was sent a track uh, to add some cello parts to, and um, we kind of you know agreed what we were going to do, and and I'd already heard the track, but I hadn't really sort of listened to it that carefully, and then and it had a fade out, and I got back to the guy and said, "You haven't got a verse? You could could you send it to me without the fade?" And he said, "Well, actually, no, I haven't got that." And I think this original track was off a cassette because. I then worked out and realized that it was nowhere near concert pitch. It was actually really quite, you know, somewhere between two keys. Um, so, you know, obviously, if you play the cello part to that, you've either got to tune to the to the pitch of what you're sent or, you know. So what I ended up doing was actually I, I stuck a pitch change plug in across the original track, pitched it up to concert pitch, played the whole part because I've got perfect pitch. So it would throw me completely to be trying to tune to something that isn't a 440. Sure. So I'm, so I made it a 440, did all my cello parts and then pitched them back to the pitch of the cassette. <laughs> did, did the client you know. know you were going nope. to these nope. lengths? No. <laughs> that's why I said, I'm not sure I should be revealing all this, but no, uh, no, that's, I, I mean, it really you know, shows I did, I did. like, you know, a great <laughs> attitude, you know I mean? Like uh, that's, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, so you know, I sent it back, and he was happy. And um, hopefully, there'll be some more of that. So um, you know, because that was just part of the job, and it was a yeah, it was a little bit of an unexpected blip that I had to then deal with. But uh, you know, it's part of the job, uh, and I'm, you know, and I don't, I don't mind. It's, it's, you know, I don't mind spending a bit of extra time if the client's happy, and if you've, you know, and then you feel proud that you've done a great job, um, and you know, and that's a, that's an attitude that they don't. That that's a hard thing to teach at all. You know, going back to my educational thing. Because all these guys, they, they, you know, they, as I say, they understand Pro Tools better than me and they know all the shortcuts and they probably know all the science behind things a lot better than I do. Um, but they may not know to, you know, how to deal with those, those kind of situations. So, so <laughs> you know, that gets down to work ethic. Like, what, do, yeah. what is, you know, where does work ethic come from, in, in your opinion, or at least in your experience, would you say? Well, for, and for me, it's kind of been learned through bitter experience, I suppose, because, you, you, can, you know, when you're, when you're 18, 20, whatever, you kind of have a bit of a, an arrogant attitude. Well, I anyway, I'm sure. <laughs> sure. Yeah, all of so, us. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I don't know. But certainly, um, you know, it's something I've honed over the years, I would say, and probably got better at. Um and so just suppose, just going yeah. through the fires of, of of doing things you know yeah you have a realization that you've got to put the work in sometimes and you know so even even now if i got somebody who if it's a if it's a client who's really very famous already um and perhaps you know like uh if they're not even in the room with you you you've really got to make sure that the mix is absolutely as spot on as you i mean you do that with everybody but in particularly you know if it's somebody who's high profile then you you know you listen in your car a couple more times, or maybe you sleep on it an extra day if you've got a you know looser deadline, uh, just to make sure absolutely sure it's as good as you possibly can make it, and um, you know really 
And even then, it's a funny thing, you know, when you when you play somebody something, as soon as you play it to them, you hear it differently. And I think <laughs> even online, you, you play it to somebody and then you listen to it. And you, oh, no, hang on a minute. That hi-hat's really sure. loud. <laughs> sure. It's never I don't done. know what it is. Never. I, don't know how, I don't know how it works, how your brain does that. But some, suddenly your brain goes into a different mode as soon as, you, as soon as you've given it to the client. You go, oh, hang on a minute. <laughs> I think I, that happens less and less. So I'm getting better at what I do. I think you know. So, sometimes I do now listen to something the next day and go, "Yeah, actually, that's really good." <laughs> so, totally, so, I, I, I have think... that all the time. I have that all the time. So I know exactly <laughs> what you mean. Um, so when you're when you're working with you know, say a, a big name act or something like that, and the you know you get a reaction that's unexpected or you get some you know uh, you know that's experience, right? How you deal with that mm. from there that that's really you know cuz it's it's how you take that response and turn that into something that that really is the Absolutely. difference between yeah. an experienced engineer and a someone P- perhaps yeah i mean and certainly you know very often you'll get something and you'll be like what what's the you know the, the snare's too short what does he mean well and you get a bit angry because you've spent so long honing it to what you think is perfect or or the other irritating one is that you know they they write they they send you an email back and go do you think it might be better if we do if we turn up the vocal by a DB and you, you're like, well, if I'd thought that would have been better, I would have done it. You know? yeah. <laughs> so, so you have to kind of bite your tongue initially and then, then you kind of listen again and then you go, actually, yeah, they're probably right. I'll do that. And then you do it and then they, you send it to them and then they come back and go, no, I preferred it how you had it. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so you go so through that whole dance. Yeah. You, you kind of swap viewpoints and that, yeah. that happens whether, you know, remote or in the studio that you kind of, somebody says something and you go, oh yeah, that's a, that's a good idea. And you do it. And then they come back and go, no, actually I preferred it how you had it. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> totally. And so, so, but even mixing in a sense has always been somewhat remote because you send the client out most of the time while you're doing, Absolutely. doing yeah, the work. Yeah, no, I've, I've very early on, I, I learned to do that. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, it, it's quite, it can be good having somebody in the room for the sort of the last few tweaks perhaps or something. But then again, they're not on a familiar set of speakers. So, so you know, then they have to take it home and listen to it again. And I've had numerous clients in the last probably five or 10 years who, you know, they, they come over because they're relatively local and they go, well, yeah, we wanted somebody who's near so that we could come over and hear mixes. And then you never see them again. You know, you do, you do it all over the Internet, even though they're right. 15, 20 minutes, half an hour up the road. They, they don't ever come back because it's because they it's better for them to hear it on their familiar hi-fi and in their car or whatever. Uh, and it's easy for me to kind of do a quick tweak and, and send it back to them. So, um so it works great. What sort of input do you like, like in the in the early the before you start, like when? In... I'll I'll always ask if they've got any particular references. Um, you know that that's helpful, but you, sometimes they haven't, and that's cool as well because you know presumably they've come to me because they like what I've done. Um, and sometimes maybe it's it's interesting to find out what it is I've done that they like, which gives me a little bit of an indication of what they're expecting. But no, I'm happy to just dive in and, and do what I think is right. And, um, you know, and if, if you send it and it's not right, then, you know, I, they, you go somewhere else and, and you get there. You always get there. You always do something that eventually that, <laughs> that works, you know. So if, the, if, if someone were to say, like, you know, that's a project for George, like, you know, that sort of encapsulates all the, the strengths that you bring to the table, is there such a thing is am i putting you too much in a box or something like that by asking <laughs> well, that question this is, I, I yeah I, it's a difficult one because i think i probably have over the years lost out on stuff because people don't know where to place me necessarily because i've done such a wide range of different kinds of music um so that can be a bit of a handicap but um you know it it, it does tend to be people who play the guitar a bit or a piano a bit or something and and um but no I, i'm you know it, i i like doing projects where i can add a bit of my own playing to it that's the, i think that was the classic sort of tony visconti thing he likes to put a tambourine on or something you know and I, I quite like a bit of that sometimes um you know if somebody wants a bit of cello or a bit of tambourine or a bit of whatever it, or and also it's adding value I, I think the most satisfying projects to me are the ones where you get something and you go, oh yeah, it needs this, it needs that. Let's chop out half of the middle eight, and you know, uh, oh, and it could do with some extra bits of whatever. Um, then you kind of feel like you've really added some value. Whereas if you get something, the rough mix sounds great. <laughs> then you right. sort of think, well, how can I improve it? I don't know. Oh, can I can I get it any better? But then sometimes then that's that's the challenge. You know, I had a band 
um, and they'd done a, one of them was had his own little demo studio, and they'd done a great demo of this song. And you know, at the beginning of the day, they came to record one song, and you know, I was thinking, oh, I hope I can get it better than, <laughs> than the demo. Um, and I did kind of keep referring back because they were, you know, they were replaying stuff and not playing some of the parts that were on the demo, which I really liked. So I was, you know, I was adamant. I was making sure they at least kind of did those bits, which I thought were really good. Um, and then at the end of the day, it turned out, and yes, it was loads better than the demo, thankfully, you know, and I was I was really pleased with what we came up with. But And, and I quite like having that pressure, you know, so... Um, so as long as I feel I can add something, and and usually you know usually there's there's fairly obvious things you can you can do to improve things. So uh, you know unless somebody's got a very odd vision of how they want it, which which that can happen as well. You know there's this constant dilemma of if they've got a strong idea of how they want it, and you sort of think well that's a bit of a mad idea. But then who am I to say that that's a mad idea? You listen to uh, you know it's been. There was a great program on the radio here in the UK uh, over the weekend about 50 years since the Beatles White Album. Some crazy stuff on that that people just don't do now, you know, that sort of time changes and odd arrangement things. And uh, so, you know, if the Beatles can do completely bananas things, then who am I to say you can't do completely bananas things? We've all got so sensible now that everything's in Pro Tools and you know on a click and everything's eight bars long and <laughs> so so i'm all for i'm all for a bit of craziness you know as long as people can justify it <laughs> what do you think what are some of the qualities you think that that lend towards good production so like you're as as producer now you're wearing the producer hat like what what, what yeah. types of things do you like to do like do you well the qualities? first thing i'll do is yeah i mean the first thing i do is look at the song structure um if i'm recording somebody from scratch um I'll sit down and write down how many bars each section has and how many beats are here and there and and what you know what's giving it a lift and what's keeping it interesting. So I think the you know the arrangement and the structure are central before you even start recording anything. Um and I'll often as a as a example if I if I think something needs a bit of radical surgery then I'll perhaps load a demo in if there is one and chop it up and show the people i'm recording what i think should happen you know uh, so i can sort of do some very bad edits but at least kind of give them an idea of how the structure is going to be um so so that's important and the other thing that is is very often you know most songs the most important thing is the vocal so if you look at my if you open my mixing sessions very often there's maybe you know one or two plugins on each of the drum tracks and maybe a three or four on the bass track but there's sometimes you know sometimes there's loads of plugins on the vocals because that's you know i'm just sort of trying to hone it and tweak it and get it sure. they're, they're not all doing very much but sometimes i'm doing you know lots of little different things to, to get the vocals to sit just right um you know because i know a lot i know some producers and mixers um will do an awful lot of vocal rides um and sometimes there'll be a l little bit of detail work in terms of turning down the breaths or something like that you know or, or de-essing manually sure. by turning down the so it's really it, the thing is it's whatever it need whatever needs doing you know it, it's difficult to say what you're going to do until you hear something it's reacting so being good at, being a good producer is reacting and doing whatever's necessary and sometimes you're you know you're turning things up or down or doing the most sort of radical adjustments that look a bit crazy but if that's what it needs that's what you do so um you know you can't sort of look up the ideal settings on somebody's youtube video and go oh right if it's a, if it's sure. a hi-hat or turn up 12k you you do i mean you do have sort of certain go-to things but um, it's it's an intuitive uh process yeah i mean it's basically focusing on the this is what i'll be telling these students tomorrow it, it's focusing on the goal rather than which plugins you're using perhaps you know and I, I tend to be quite lazy with that i've got my favorite main compressor and eq which i use you know at least sort of three quarters of the time on all channels uh because i'm familiar with them i know what they're going to do they've got a real good character to them they're great quality bits of software um and you know you can predict the result and it just kind of gets you there quicker and you can get so easily distracted with the technology um you've got to really be listening carefully all the time and just making sure you're focusing on getting to you know the thing in stereo as a record <laughs> rather sure. than getting distracted i've said you know I've done, i remember in, you know back in the old days when i was i was on uh dave gilmore from pink floyd has a most beautiful studio on a boat um and i i did some sessions there with somebody and we spent three days on a mix fiddling around with tiny little fader rides of 
this, that, and the other. Uh, and after three days, we thought it was great. And then we listened to it, uh, you know, a couple of weeks later. It was terrible. We <laughs> we'd had to mix it again. So, <laughs> so you can get easily distracted by all these unnecessary details. And sometimes the best mixes are when you've got a deadline or where you, where you don't even think you've quite finished. You know, it's like, right, you've got half an hour. Get it sound good. And you get the vocals and you can put a damn hot compressor on it, you know, and squash it to oblivion and and get make sure you can hear the snare drum and and whack it down and you, and that's great you know and sometimes it's then really hard to improve on that. <laughs> so, um you know sometimes it's good to experiment and fiddle around with different things if and come back to stuff but uh, I, the trouble is nothing's ever finished now unless there's a deadline is that you can you can so quickly easily open up pro tools and have a further fiddle with it. Yeah, and, it's one um, of the dangers for sure. Well, yeah, and it, you know, Giles Martin. I'm not sure how I feel about him remixing all the Beatles stuff at the moment. You know, I think uh, it's it's like retouching, you know, sort of the Mona Lisa and having oh, I'm just make that blue a little bit brighter. Or <laughs> it's like when, when do you stop? When do you stop fiddling? That's it's it's, it's a good question. It's a central question. Um, bring brings me to like you know. So if if fast forwarded to today, if you were starting out today in, in the today's music industry mm. uh, I, I know sort of very hypothetical but i mean mm. w w how would you approach things you know giving what we know about th how things have changed so much in the last few years yeah you know? well i it has changed enormously you know because obviously when i started it's um, i wouldn't have even dreamed of having my own studio because it cost half a million quid to buy a mixing desk and a tape machine right um and now you can buy a 500 pounds laptop and have everything you need um so i don't know i suppose um i would look at a lot on i mean i'd put an equal amount of um work into networking and meeting the right people and going to gigs or whatever it, depending on the genre of music you're aiming for but you know certainly it's um, it's meeting the right people is a lot of it really um as well as honing your technical skills um and i think also the th the other thing that's changed is that um when I started working at Livingston Studios, it was frowned upon to, for me to sort of have musical ability or have any opinion about, you know, because I was meant to be making the tea um, and not, <laughs> not getting involved in. But now I think it's more acceptable to do a bit of everything and diversify. Um, you know, in the old days, you'd have one job and you were the, you were the engineer. So you got Jeff Emmerich, who died a week or two ago, sure. uh, the Beatles engineer. He was, you know, he was a fantastic engineer and that's what he did. Um, he was a recording engineer, um, but but now you can be a recording engineer. You can turn up and do a few lectures at universities. You can write a few articles in magazines. You can play a bit of cello, and and it's all good. You know, and people don't seem to mind too much. I, I, well, I get away with it anyway. <laughs> yeah, it may, it may be essential too, right? I mean, do a few air games. Yeah, or I do, suppose. But I, mean... I, I think it also helps your abilities because from playing the cello, you listen carefully to the tuning. Um, and that helps your listening skills, hearing a few real instruments. And, you know, I play in an amateur orchestra every Friday night and I go and soar away on my cello and we play, you know, Brahms and Dvorak and whatever else. Um, and then we go down the pub and I meet people who aren't in the music business and have a have a couple of drinks. And it just refreshes your brain a bit. And then you and then you hone your listening. And I also play chamber music. I play in a string quartet. So that's fantastic for, you know, because you can hear yourself clearly, but you're hearing all the details. And then, you know, and, uh, because you're a recording engineer and you're aware of clicks and pops, it means you're a bit more careful when you bang your bow down or turn the pages over, you know, when right. you're playing the cello. So each thing feeds into the other thing and is complementary, you know. So I think it's it's all good. That's cool, man. Uh, tell me about Bank Cottage, your studio. So how did that? Yeah, well, how did that come to be? That came to be because increasingly uh, people didn't have the budget to pay me and big expense for a big expensive studio to go and freelance in. Um, so I found myself working in the spare bedroom occasionally, mixing albums and fiddling about. Um, and and then I my wife adopted some children and so the bedroom wasn't spare anymore <laughs> so, so I built so I did a purpose built studio at home uh, which seemed like a great idea because I could be around when the children were at home a bit more um, and not have to keep because I live you know I live out in the countryside so it would have been so I could I did a bit less commuting to London or staying away. Um, so um so it got built and you know on a bit of a budget but it's got air conditioning and separate clean mains uh with its own earth spike 
and you know it's fairly well soundproofed and i've got room to record a band there if i need to although increasingly my work is mixing and mastering and and also working with solo artists where it's just all going on in the control room so so the bigger room is the control room um and unusually it's got the piano in there and a few other instruments hammond organ and so on um but it, it works great yeah it's 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 comfortable and it, it's sort of conducive to it's in a nice village and it's conducive to creativity and we've got a very fast internet connection which is handy for those online jobs we've got the proper fiber broadband um That's and it, and i've been you know it's been it was set up 15 years ago but i've forever been improving it and buying more stuff you know and of course you're always upgrading your software but also because i have a, another diversification is that i write for a magazine um resolution which is an international pro audio publication so i get sent things to review which is wonderful because you know i get to try out um outboard gear that i wouldn't otherwise trip over um and i get sent all the latest software updates of different plugins and things to try out and if i do want to buy stuff i get a good discount because i'm a journalist <laughs> that's awesome which is which is very handy. Um, so you know, without that little string to my bow, uh, Bank Cottage wouldn't be the studio that it is. So so that's a huge bonus. Um, but it, it's yeah, it's comfortable and it, it works for me. And as I say, it's quite it's a bit of a luxury because through you know I started off with the journalism 25 years ago or so, uh, writing reviews of things like lexicon reverbs and compressors and so on. Uh, and then I gradually branched out into doing interviews, and there were a few video interviews done as well which i did in collaboration with uh, recordproduction.com which is a run by a friend of mine mike banks who actually works for solid state logic um so uh, through doing all the sort of interviews i've met lots of other great producers i've i've you know i've interviewed tony visconti and all kinds of people um but it, it never ceases to amaze me some of these guys have rooms that are far inferior to mine or seemingly inferior to mine um so you know, I, I feel very lucky that I've got my studio so beautifully set up because I've I've been in some places that have terrible acoustics, and yet people are making great records in them. <laughs> so, sure. So, uh, so you know. when you were build when you were building it, I think I I read somewhere that you had an architect at first, but then you kind of moved away and did it yourself. Is that is that right? When I did. Yeah. Well, I, uh, we'd had the drawings done of the existing place, and then I got an architect, and he went away for about six weeks or something, and came back with. Um, nothing like what I'd imagined at all, and it was it was quite small. So you know, I wanted to maximise the space really, and just have it as big as I possibly could. So so I kind of just sketched on the back of an envelope what I wanted, and the guy had done the drawings, the surveyor. I got him to draw it properly. So it was kind of kind of built to my design, really. Yeah, but I mean, it wasn't anything special. It was just a you know, just or, your, then, your vision being executed, yeah. And then, right? Well, I mean, it, yeah, I could I could easily have have a bigger vision <laughs> given the given the budget, right? And, you know, and I may I may end up moving somewhere else and may end up doing something completely different, but uh, it kind of works. And it was sort of you know, it was made made up as we went along, really. So the the wall that goes between the control room and the recording room, uh, we did it on in such a way that you know the brick layer turned up to build that wall and said, well, how do you where do you want it exactly? <laughs> so and we just said, oh, about there. Uh, let's put it at a bit of an angle because that'll help the acoustics and it was all done you know just like that as we went along really nice um, nice so yeah so it, it works great if, if somebody on air gig say wanted to book like a songwriter um wanted to produce a full song with you there could you procure the musicians and do the I, recording i'm there? sure i could yeah. absolutely yeah okay, i'm sure so that's I could. a possibility okay well yeah yeah you know i'd love to and, I, and that does happen you know i get people approach me directly to do that kind of thing um obviously i'm in a fairly rural area so musicians are slightly thin on the ground very near here sure. <laughs> but we can usually wrestle you know i know lots of good drummers and people like that and then depending on the budget, you know, I can bluff a few parts myself, you know, very often we, with given that we've got this, all this great tuning technology and putting things in time so easily. Um, you know, I, I'm quite creative with a, with a bass guitar and, uh, <laughs> sure. And we know a few remote session musicians we can, well, exactly. I do like getting a few guys in and, and drummers are great fun to work with, you know, and having, having somebody really there doing it is, is brilliant. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm all up for that. That's awesome. Well, I, I 
really appreciate your time. I don't want to. I know you have to. Uh, no, that's fine. Cruise I'm, tomorrow. I'm but... happy to chat. To... <laughs> okay, cool. So, what would be like speaking to the, like you're going to be speaking to some young engineers and and and, su- and such tomorrow? What what are some essentials that you try to communicate that are not necessarily like uh, you know um, technical, but more rules to guide by? Or... Yeah. Well, I think I think listening skills is essential is an essential thing to develop. Um, so getting familiar with your monitoring and, and listening to things carefully um, and having, as I say before, having that focus on the goal of a finished record, um, because it is so easy to get distracted along the way. So it's achieving, you know, it's knowing what you're trying to achieve and then and then doing, you know, finding the shortest route to achieving that in some time, in some cases um you know unless it's the kind of project like i don't know like talk talk where they're going to spend a year with the lights off making a kind of rt record and just experimenting all the time but uh, generally people want to get a result you know in a in a budget on a budget and uh, make something sound great and exciting um how, so how, do you, it's, how do you become a better listener or how do you um I develop don't know. I, I, I don't, i'm not entirely sure i suppose it's just but through practicing as much as anything um yeah, and listening to other records on your monitoring system, and you know, it's it's very difficult to compare things because the slightest difference in levels between things, obviously, something that's a bit louder is enormously more more impressive. So, so if you play your own mix two dBs louder than whatever's coming out of the CD player, then you you'll think you're doing an amazing job. <laughs> so it's right. very difficult to it's very difficult to compare and you know and judge things. Um, First, is it good to have uh, a vari- like you know? Obviously, when you're just starting out, budget is a concern, so you don't maybe have uh, a wide range of different monitoring systems you can listen through. But do you recommend like just a? Well, I, I I've got very lazy, and uh, when I before I built Bank Cottage, I used to freelance in lots of studios around town and you know around the world, uh, and I and I you know kind of knew what my favorite speakers were, and so therefore. I've eventually saved up and equipped myself with with some with a pair of those, which are my ATCs. Uh, you know, I happen to find that they work really well for me. That they make me work harder. And and uh, always, when I was freelancing, I'd find that when I did mixes on those particular monitors, that I'd I'd get home and be happy with what I'd done, which wasn't the case with some of their rival <laughs> ones you'd find in studios. So um, so yeah, it's just it's just finding what you're your tastes are and what works for you and so i've kind of and they and they sound great loud or quiet so you know i'm very lazy and probably listen on them 95 percent of the time and then i'll maybe have a listen on some smaller speakers or on a pair of headphones yeah because increasingly Um, i would say i mean how much music is consumed these days on a iphone or a laptop absolutely yeah no that's all important and you know i've still got a pair of oratones which were you know, sort of 1970s speaker technology for you know, the idea of being that they sound a bit like what it's going to be like on the radio. Uh, I've still got a pair of those. <laughs> so, so I still listen on those occasionally. And, I, and I've got a fairly good pair of headphones that I, you know, I like to sort of listen, which is great for sort of uh, checking the, the panning and all that kind of stuff for people who are listening on their earbuds. So, yeah, it's, you know, that's obviously important too. And, and people still hear things in mono, you know, because certain phones and devices will have one speaker and so things are things are still listened to in mono occasionally so um sure. you know that's 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 got to it's got to work in all those things but i think i i i got to the point where i think i you know i'm experienced enough to know that it's going to work without me having to necessarily sit down and listen all the way through in mono to make sure because you know, i kind of know what you know I, I think just through experience what it's going to sound like in mono to a degree um, unless you've got some crazy sort of phasing effects going on, um, you know, things cancelling out a bit. Um, I, I use a lot of sort of high pass filters because with digital, it's very easy to record deep below what most people can get on their speakers. Um, so you can have all this information going on that's very low frequency stuff that's not really helping you and it's kind of making your mix quieter. So, you know, one thing. I'll do very often is is put a filter on uh, to get rid of all that very low end uh, on a lot of signals like vocals and guitars and things that don't need to be filling up all that area. 
Sure. So that's interesting. So when you approach a mix, you have some just general uh, housekeeping that you do usually. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm very traditional. and I like to have my tracks in the right order of, you know, drums, then bass, then guitars, then keyboards, then strings, then science experiments, and then <laughs> effects. You know, uh, and I, and I set it up like a desk with a re. You know, my my mixing template is very simple. It's it's one reverb on a on an aux send, one delay. Uh, well, two delays. I have, a, I have a short delay, and then I have a long panning one for special effects, and a sort of chorus effects. Uh, and I have my mix bus set up in Pro Tools with a bunch of inserts, kind of disabled but ready to go. Um, so I mix pretty much in the box. Although I do have one external uh, insert that I come out and use now, which is an analog tape simulator. Um, which I think really just it's very subtle, but it just makes things a bit more listenable. Um, and I use it for recording signals as well. Um, but I come out of the box and back in again for that. Um, so that's my so my simple mixing te te template is is all set up and ready. And then in Pro Tools, you can have your favorite EQ and your favorite uh, compressor on a kind of, you know, easily accessible. So I have those set, um, which are the Harrison EQ, four band EQ, which is a very simple sweep EQ. Uh, hasn't got many knobs on it, but it's got great filters. Um, it's quick to use because it doesn't have a, any bandwidth controls. Um, but I find I can get most of what I need from that. And it's the, it's based on the the EQ that was in the desk that was used for all the Michael Jackson hits and all the ABBA hits, oh. pretty much. So, so so I kind of think if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. Absolutely, <laughs> so. absolutely. So what's coming up for you this these coming? You know, looking forward into the fall and winter anything? i'm not sure um taking I get it one day at a time that, yeah pretty much i do get a lot of very short notice things people always want stuff at short notice there's lots of kind of people talking about things uh i've just been doing another kind of online session which has got uh, it's a french guitarist uh which has hank marvin playing on one track oh, wow. um so i think there might be a little bit more of that to do um I'm not sure what's in that. I have to have. I have I'm really terrible at this. <laughs> I just have to. Look, I have to have a look at my. Well, you're a busy man too. I mean, you're doing the <laughs> interviews. For, you're you're educating. You're doing online sessions. Yeah. You're doing local sessions. So, you know, I understand. There's, and and there's it's... plenty going on. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've got. I know what I've got. Well, there's a there's a artist called Fish Tank, which is basically two people. It's a, it's a guy um, from Devon who does all the kind of programming, and it's a bit prog rock. It's a bit it's kind of. Pink Floydy, but lots of synthesizery stuff, and a female vocalist who's, I think she's half Italian and half Greek, and um, lives in London. Uh, so she's coming up at the weekend to do some vocals on a track, and then we'll have got five songs all recorded, and two of them have been mixed so far. So I've got to get on and finish all that off. Um, but they're great fish tank, and they've they've got some interest in the states, I think, from the label set at the moment. So so we're trying to get that finished so they can release that. Um, so that's that's a that's a kind of hybrid session, you know. They come and do the recording, and he's a guitarist as well as he'll provide me with all the kind of keyboard parts. He'll come and record some of the guitars with me because I'm better at recording than than he is at home, because I've got some nice microphones and I can tell him what to do. <laughs> he's, he comes up with some very weird chords, so so I try and try and filter out some of the weirder notes. <laughs> <when he's here. laughs> so you're a good team. Good yes. Team. So, uh, but we've we've got a couple of tracks mixed, which I'm very proud of, and they're sounding really good. Um, so, yeah, things like that, all kinds, all kinds of and stuff. And you're really. you're often at Abbey Road Studios, right? I saw you uh, there. Well, I have been, in. not that often, but yeah, I think there is another one of those at some point coming up in the not too distant future. Um, that's often been with uh, a friend of mine, James Hawkins, who is a he's a choir master and a producer. Uh, so when he's got a choir session, he kind of conducts the choir, and he, he I'm kind of his trusted ears in the control room um and i've got another project actually which i've been doing with a solo artist um who's been talking to me about wanting to record a choir so i've suggested to him that we go to abbey road perhaps um and if the budget's there we might go and do that at abbey road or we might end up doing it in a small village hall <laughs> i don't know depending on if he's got any money um that's ambitious that's an, yeah yeah but that's, that's another choir recording to do i think it's going to you know something like 60 people in the choir so that'd be a bit of fun oh that sounds um, like fun yeah so all kinds of things going on well cool man well it was a pleasure catching up with you likewise david thank you for listening to me blabbering on Oh, no, no, it's been great. And it's been a while since our last interview. And, and I hope to do more with you 
coming up. This is just the start of this podcast, and we've got a few episodes in, and this will be our third. So fantastic! Well, I'm I'm deeply honoured to be so far up the list. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> George! You were one of the first people, you know, uh, who 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 joined on with Air Gigs and oh, good. had a good, good attitude and has had you know clients have been raving about you so we're well that's very lovely i ought to update my profile more often <laughs> i think there's a picture of me looking very young and gorgeous on there you know and now i'm i'm old and very gray you know <laughs> uh, don't worry don't worry um but yeah man so we're gonna be um looking forward to more of these i hope and uh, please Absolutely. keep us posted on on your activities because we i certainly shall we will uh like to support them retweet them you know share them out there and uh create a little virtuous circle of <laughs> excellent well I, I love doing the jobs with air gigs i think i think it all, it's it's a very slick operation and it all works very beautifully so i'm you know more than happy to to help and collaborate where possible all right man well uh, again, great talking to you, and I will be in touch soon, and we'll uh, talk more. Thank you, David. All the best. All the best, man. Bye. Cheerio. Bye.